Hello everyone, I'm your host Egg Gotham and welcome to another episode of Opto Sessions where we interview the top investors from around the world uncovering their secrets to success. Today we have Michael Green on the show, Chief Strategist at Simplify Asset Management. Simplify offers a range of innovative options-based ETFs tackling today's biggest portfolio challenges. Michael has been a student at the markets and market structure for nearly 30 years. Highlights in his career include managing macro strategies at Teal Macro, an investment firm that manages the personal capital of Peter Teal, founding Ice Farm Capital, a discretionary global macro hedge fund seeded by Soros Fund Management, and founding and managing the New York office of Canyon Capital Advisors, a 23 billion multi-strategy hedge fund based in LA. In this interview, we discuss whether or not we've hit peak oil, even with China reopening. Are we witnessing the end of passive investing? And how to use options-based ETFs as part of your portfolio. Enjoy. Hi, Michael. Thanks for joining us on the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Ed. Thank you for having me. And uh, where where are you calling from? Uh, I am calling you from Northern California, just outside of San Francisco. Oh, wow. So it's the morning there. It is early morning here. The sun is just starting to break over the horizon. Okay. Yeah, so I'm in in London, so sort of late afternoon here. Um, but yeah, thanks again for the opportunity to, to have you on the show. And um, how long have you been in, in the investment game for? I've been doing this for about 30 years. Wow. So I graduated uh, from university back in 1992. And you, you, you knew straight away what you wanted to do? Uh, I, I wouldn't say I knew straight away, but I've, I've always been involved in the process of security valuation analysis, whether that was in management consulting, where I did a lot of advising of corporations to when I transitioned to formally being a portfolio manager in 1999. Yeah. Um, I've been listening to a, a few of your recent podcasts. One of them was on geopolitics. Uh, I thought we could could start there. Um, just, I mean, it was a long show, so there's so much to talk about. And um, I just, it, it's an interesting time, obviously, globally. Uh, a lot of the world is becoming, in some ways, more, more related, but other ways further apart. Um, how much of a risk do you think ongoing geopolitical issues are to the financial markets going forward? Are, are we entering an era where there might be more volatility? whether it be digital, economic, or more classic, um, based on problems that the, the, the economies are having in the world? Well, so, so first, I mean, relative to the experience that most of us had, I think it'd be difficult to have less geopolitical uh, yeah. events occur, right? So the United States, while it has helmed you know, two and a half wars since the fall of the Soviet Union, has largely been in an unchallenged position globally until, you know, I would argue... Um, the global financial crisis began to draw very clear um, weaknesses in the U.S.-led system, and we began to experience challenges from both China and Russia to kind of this dynamic of the U.S. as benevolent hegemon to the world, right? Um, So I think it's just, I think it's hard to see there being less geopolitics than there has been in the period in the past. I think the flip side of that, of course, is the current narrative is this idea of deglobalization, right? And I just don't, I don't think that's actually a feasible outcome, right? Once you've actually started the process of instantaneous communications around the globe where you and I can have a face-to-face conversation from you know, nine time zone differences um, and do so at extraordinarily low cost, it's hard for me to imagine that I'm going to decide to stop utilizing the resources that are provided by people in England or people in Europe or people in Asia, um, that I'm not going to you know, seek integration and the opportunity to expand that. The challenge, of course, is that the world's second leading economy and the U.S. are, are very tightly bound in a way similar to, say, France and England, right, would have been historically on trading relationships and everything else. Unfortunately, we're just not getting along, right? We don't feel comfortable with the way they're using the proceeds from trade with us. We don't feel comfortable. They don't feel comfortable with us continuing to assert our dominance or expressing a desire to assert our dominance. And that leads to challenges, right? I mean, many people have talked about this in the the context of what's called the Thucydides trap, which is, you know, the leading economy feels threatened and therefore tries to push the emerging economy into war. Certainly possible. 
I mean, that that feels certainly like what is happening right now, that the U.S. is trying to push China into revealing its intent as it relates to Taiwan, the South China Sea, et cetera. Yeah. And obviously the question on many people's minds is how is how is that going to affect markets? And um, historically, I mean, we've had people on the show before have the opinion of, you know, regardless of what geopolitical events play out over time, it doesn't really affect the markets long term. Is that a viewpoint you have as well, or, or will it cause some markets to do better than others? I mean, a lot of people are thinking about the US in particular when they look back, I think, on that, um, which has had a period of pretty good period of, of not being too involved uh, domestically, like apart from investing in, you know, they've been involved in wars elsewhere. But um, if you look back at, because I think people reference uh, World War II, I think the US stock market actually did pretty well, but I don't think the European ones did as well. Um, so that is a, like a, a, an example maybe of, of how it, different markets can be affected, but I don't know what your opinion on the matter is. Well, so I think, you know, one, there's an obvious component there, right, which is it's easier for your um, industrial base and for your economy to thrive when the action's not happening on your soil, right? So one of the challenges that you had in the German stock market was in the 1930s under the Nazi regime, they actually set rules that they treated the stock market as a sign of national success. And so they established rules that did not allow the stock market to go down. Right now, that seems like a wonderful thing, right? You know, it only goes up. Unfortunately, it's the exact same behavior that we saw in Japan very recently, where effectively transactions stop, right? Because if things can only go up and a factory gets blown up or all the productive capacity of the company is destroyed, they have no real mechanism. They have no real access to capital under that framework, right? Now, do I think something like that's going to happen in the United States? I think that'd be pretty extreme. But those are the kind of the key risks that policy becomes much more important than almost anything else. And that's the area that I spend most of my time worrying about. I can very safely say, like, we've never had a situation where a country has contemplated recovery from a pandemic or entering into a Cold War type framework and decided that the solution to do that was to radically raise their cost of borrowing, dramatically increase their fiscal transfers to the rest of the world of US dollars by raising interest rates on our bonds. Like This is one of the stranger things I've ever seen in political history, and, and I, I guess I would label it theater. And I'm still left kind of scratching my head going, it's possible I don't understand the game in total, but I, I really don't understand why we're deciding to engage in what I would perceive to be very much an own goal, right? Scoring on ourselves. Yep. If we can segue now into, I'd love to know, just not focus on geopolitics in particular, but like what was your macro outlook for the year considering where we are today? Um, Globally, maybe your outlook, but also in particular, what you think is going to happen to the U.S. Yeah, so I, I, I think it's, you know, the, the real challenge, I guess, that I would highlight for where we sit today um, is that we came through a very difficult period for bonds and equities last year. People's natural conclusion is to say, well, that indicates that something was priced in, right, that the, the events of a recession have been priced in advance. Unfortunately, I just don't see any real evidence of that. So there's not been a diversion or, or dispersion between the valuations of high quality companies and low quality companies. In fact, if you look at things like um, the, you know, the equity risk premium for the market in total, because interest rates have gone up so much more than valuations have compressed, you're actually seeing more speculative valuation than you've seen in the past. Um, there was a good uh, piece that was just put out today where uh, you know, it was highlighting that the U.S. premium, the, the, excess return, the excess valuation that's priced in the U.S. markets may go away. And then, of course, there's a chart in it. I could show the chart that says the exact opposite, right? We're at the highest level of relative valuations on a sector adjusted basis that we've ever been in the United States. Um, and so I, I find it very hard to argue that a recession is priced in. Right. What I think actually happened last year was is that the Federal Reserve hiked interest rates in an unanticipated fashion. If I run a portfolio that is systematically rebalanced, and that is increasingly the case, 
if the Fed hikes interest rates, my bond portfolio has to fall by definition. If yep. my bond portfolio falls, then I have to sell equities, buy bonds, to rebalance my portfolio. And by and large, that's all that happened last year. We actually saw a sideways market between bonds and equities that I believe was a direct function of what the Fed was doing rather than the market trying to price any form of, uh, of recession. I think, unfortunately, now we have a recession pretty much baked into the cake. I actually would argue that we're probably in it already. If you look at metrics like continuing jobless claims in the United States or traditional measures of economic strength, things like the ISM New Orders Index, et cetera, the housing market in the United States, they're, they're all sitting in the toilet, right? That's a technical term we use for when things are down. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this year to me is going to be the more interesting one where you do begin to see a bit of a, div a, a diffusion in terms of or dispersion in terms of the pricing of companies that are very exposed to the need to refinance their debt, um, companies that are going to experience significant operational difficulties if the economy goes into recession. None of that is currently priced in from what I can see. And at what point would you consider it pricing in? What, how, do you, how do you monitor that? So things that I'm always looking for are spreads in the credit market, right? So the spread between lower quality credits and higher quality credits that had widened out a little bit at the start of 2022 and has subsequently closed so that we're not quite at all time tights, but we're, we're basically at average. There's no real indicators of, dis of distress. If I extend that to valuation in the equity markets, the premium that's being paid for quality companies defined as companies with high profitability, relatively low capital investment requirements, you know, stable patterns of, of cash flow, et cetera, it's actually almost as low as it's ever been, right? You're paying less for quality companies relative to junk companies than almost any time in history. And that's pretty remarkable when you think about the dynamics of how levered the U.S. economy is, many of the corporates are, particularly in the aftermath of 2020, and the reliance on very low interest rates if those interest rates were to rise or as the interest rates have risen, if they're forced to refinance into this interest rate environment, you could see a very rapid deterioration in fundamentals. And historically, so a lot of people have been talking about when the Fed pivots, um, that's the time that you might see liquidity, liquidity return to the system. You know, things recover, start going up again, even if fundamentally some of the problems under the surface haven't been solved that that might happen is that what's your viewpoint on that and yeah i think that's yeah so i think that's going to be interesting because i think um you know interestingly enough that's almost the flip side of what i was discussing before right so fed cuts interest rates the bond market does well in turn that leads me to need to sell bonds buy equities as long as that um behavior is consistent, you should actually anticipate a Fed pivot or the Fed beginning to cut interest rates as a net positive for financial markets. The problem, of course, is why they cut interest rates. Right? Mm -hmm. Do they cut interest rates for the sheer joy of cutting interest rates or do they cut interest rates in reaction to an event that has occurred? And unfortunately, my bias is, is that we're headed towards a dynamic where they're going to be forced to respond rather than choose to, you know, then, then, uh, willingly choose to respond. This is the classic, you know, once something breaks, does the Fed respond? I also yeah. think that you're in a really weird place because the Fed has, you know, gone from telling us in 2021, we're not going to hike interest rates to a very long time to 2022 and the start of 2023, we're getting headlines saying we're not going to cut interest rates for a very long yeah. amount of time, right? At some point, they may feel the overwhelming need to not respond simply to maintain their credibility. Yeah. Right. And, you know, that's a little bit like a doctor who's operating and says, oh, it's gallbladder disease opens you up and discovers that you've got, you know, lung cancer and be like, well, let's take out the gallbladder anyway. You know, like not a great policy, but that seems to be the direction that we're headed. And do you think, um, well, actually, at what point, if that is likely to happen at some point, but maybe not so uh, close to that 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 point yet, but when would you consider the Fed are forced into making a decision like that? Well, as I said, I think it's going to be a stochastic component of does something break that is of significance, okay. 
that the Fed needs to respond to it. Now, areas that are very obvious in that category, right? Um, everything ranging from vehicle financing, we've seen an extraordinary surge in borrowing to, bar to buy yeah. cars in the United States, the asset-backed securities market, you know, which incorporates everything from snowmobiles to cars to um, RVs to, you know, trucks for work, et cetera. Those markets seem to very much be under stress. The commercial real estate market, quite obviously, is under stress where there's a significant amount of debate around what are the long term ramifications of work from home? How does that influence demand for commercial real estate? And you're already seeing actions being taken at what I would argue are very short-sighted by cities like New York City to reduce service on the subways, right, because the traffic is down, right? In other words, what they're doing is, is they're taking the people who are already struggling to transit and go to work in New York City, and they're making their job harder. It's making it less attractive for people to go back to work, right? In my opinion, that's a very short-sighted short policy, Right. Yeah. They're effectively saying, you know, let's try to save some money right now as compared to investing to make sure that cities are safe and um, uh, welcoming for people that want to commute to work and go back to a, a, a status quo. We'll, we'll see how that plays out. But, you know, we're currently in the let's punish people. You know, the beatings will continue until morale improves sort of mode. And do you after if we're saying this recession is inevitable, and if it plays out, uh, obviously that's going to result in a period of uh, deflation. But do you think it, inflation will be a problem again afterwards, or do you think it will be solved once we go through that cycle? Well, this is the core of my frustration with our response function, right? Um, and this is largely true for the UK as well. Because we have failed to um, have good policy, and I can take that back for a very long period of time, we don't have to start in the last two years, but because we've not had coordinated, thoughtful policy around everything ranging from fiscal to infrastructure investment to human capital development to immigration, because we've largely failed on those fronts, you know, we've now created conditions that are likely to generate increases in, in prices as they move to new sustainable levels. Right. Um, taking China out of the equation to me actually seems like one of the least important of those. So we're already seeing Apple, for example, easily move its production easily in some air quotes, right? Because it's obviously not painless, but Apple is moving its production to India. This is not that hard, right? It's not that hard. And Indians work for roughly one tenth of what the Chinese work for, right? So, wow. you know, this is this this is not necessarily an inflationary event. And if anything, I think people should be more concerned about the risks that China never emerges as a significant consumer. Like that seems to be the far more deflationary impact from my standpoint. But the flip side of it is, is if we're not willing to use their labor, right, if we're not willing to accept that they can discount stuff, that their brands can be sold into our markets at lower prices, we will have to deal with higher price levels and also increased inelasticity in terms of the price response because the supply is not as deep, right? Um, and I think that's one of the things that is just so frustrating about this is, is that instead of deciding to use policy in a thoughtful way to increase supplies and introduce new technologies and new solutions into the manufacturing process, logistics chains, energy production, et cetera, instead we're basically trying to kill the economy. Right. And cut off the demand side. That strikes me as a very risky and candidly counterproductive dynamic that effectively is just reinterjected volatility into what we used to call the great moderation, you know, a system that was inherently less volatile than it had been at times in the past. And given your sort of outlook for the year, what what assets could do well, could not do so well, um, given this market environment or how should people be approaching investing in this environment? My favorite asset on a you know for the year has been uh, a combination of the front end of the U.S. curve and a steepener at the back end of the curve. Effectively positioning myself for if something is going to break or if the recession is going to deepen and become more obvious, and ultimately the Fed is forced to pivot. 
right? Now, as I've said elsewhere, I'm renting that position because again, I think the Fed has introduced a ton of volatility, has created conditions under which interest rates are likely to be less stable going forward. And so it's harder to take a long-term directional point of view, similar to a 40-year bull market. That's obviously quite exceptional. But on a short term basis, like I have a find a very hard time, I, I have a very hard time looking at, you know, four plus percent cash yields and saying that's not a particularly attractive place to go when I'm looking at three month annualized rates of inflation in the two and a half percent range, forward looking inflation metrics suggesting below two percent, you know, into the one percent range, with you leaving me with a one year real yield on cash of around three percent. And if I can get 3% risk-free, that's not a terrible place to be, particularly given my concerns about the economic outlook. Yeah. And I think you can do slightly better than that in things like twos, yeah. right? So you, you can capture some additional appreciation. We've worked hard at Simplify to introduce products that allow people to take advantage of that. We have a product TUA that's a levered version of the two-year bond that should do very well. It's the largest single position by notional component in the macro portfolio that I run. Um, likewise, we have a product TYA, which is a, uh, a levered two, uh, 10 year, and we also have an interest rate hedge product, PFIX. Combining those in various ways gives me exposure to both the front end and to the steepener trade that I was highlighting. From your point of view, do you think we've entered a new market regime looking longer term of, of higher volatility? So I think there's two reasons why the answer to that is yes, right? Um, the first reason is, again, I think the Fed is now locked itself into a pattern where it is somewhat worse than a stopped clock. It's never going to be right because it's reacting to trailing data. So when inflation was rising, they didn't react because they were looking at the trailing data and saying it'll come back. It'll be totally transitory. If I look at what they're doing right now, they're saying, well, we have to keep going until inflation is gone, even as leading measures of inflation have already turned negative, right? So rents are now negative on a month over month basis. They've, done, they've been negative for a couple of months now. Alan Blinder, um, the you know, noted economist, has highlighted that PCE on a three month annualized basis is only running around two and a half percent. Nobody seems to care, right? All anyone wants to do is focus on the trailing numbers which is kind of ridiculous when you think about it, right? We, you know, I'm talking about interest rates and what happens over the next year. And I'm now comparing that to what happened last year to prices. That's not an information trade, right? That's, uh, that, that's actually just a mistake is kind of the easiest way to think about it. There's nothing that last year's inflation tells me about this year's inflation other than components of autocorrelation, just meaning last year tends to be like this year. Hmm. Um, so I, I think we're just in a very unfortunate place where the Fed is trying to address the last problem on a continuing and relatively fast paced basis. That just means they're making mistake after mistake after mistake. And that's interjecting volatility into the system. Um, the second component and second question is just the natural transition that's occurring as the baby boomers finally age out of our economy and the millennials come into positions of increased managerial authority, right? So we're starting to see the first transitions of companies that are being led by those who are in their 30s and 40s. That's totally different. We're going to eventually see new leadership emerge on the political front. That also creates degrees of uncertainty. We just don't know what the next generation is going to bring. Um, those are reasons for fundamental volatility. On the market structure volatility, and this is the stuff that I'm really you know, reasonably well known for, the single most important thing that continues to matter is the growth of systematic and passive strategies. And those strategies have continued to gain share. They're getting larger and larger in the market. And as they gain share, the market becomes increasingly inelastic, meaning small changes in supply and demand can create large changes in price. That unfortunately is what I really think has transpired overall. You know, if I think about how does Vanguard react to an Apple earnings beat or miss, well, it doesn't. It really doesn't care, right? And so those who do care are suddenly left to transact in reduced liquidity circumstances. 
that leads to higher and higher volatility over time. And it's an exponential process. I've shared this in other conversations and have graphics behind it and, and simulations that show all these components. But unfortunately, it just means that the U.S. economy or the U.S. stock market is getting riskier and therefore less attractive on a relative risk reward basis. Do you think that's primarily due to the passive investing or? I do. Yeah, I yeah. think that's primarily due to passive investing. And it's this is compounded as a problem over decades to become the issue it is today? Or? Yeah, I think that's right. And, and so, you know, I've shared in some other conversations the dynamics of how I think it might be, um, you know, how there might be a difference between U.S. markets, which have reached a level of passive penetration where they're beginning to exhibit meaningful increases in realized volatility. And in some of the emerging markets where even though there's fewer stocks in the indices, right? So the S&P 500 has 500 stocks. Theoretically, it's much more diversified. It should be lower volatility. The S&P's volatility is consistently higher than the Korean Kospi or than the Indian Sensex or Nifty, right? We're seeing things that theoretically should not be happening, yeah. but are happening. And I do think that that is because of the relative size of passive strategies. Interesting. And I just wanted to touch um, on China as well a bit more before we go on to yep. some of the, the interesting ETFs you offer. So the China obviously reopened recently. Um, what do you think, if any, the impact will be on, on global and Chinese equities? Do you think it's going to impact at all? Like some people have been predicting, you know, this is a positive sign. Industry is going to recover uh, and it will lead to recovery, at least in their stock market. And we've seen an initial uptick, but I don't know if there's deeper problems under the surface. Yeah, I, I mean, so I, I unfortunately think it, um, you know, not to be like Bill Clinton, but, you know, define reopening, right? And um, I think it's very hard to see a scenario in which China ref returns to being a full and somewhat free participant in the global economy. Um, I think it'll be a very long time before you see hordes of Chinese tourists piling onto buses and traveling around New York City or London. Um, I could be wrong about that, but historically it has been very difficult for economies to reopen from an authoritarian shutdown in which they told their citizens that the reason that they shut down is they were protecting them better than anywhere else in the world. Right. The minute you travel abroad and you realize that's not actually the case, you come back and you're potentially a dissident or you don't come back. And for China, that's really a catastrophic situation. And so everything that I'm seeing around the reopening, I think you have to be very careful in not over interpreting or over indexing on this. But I'm not actually seeing a lot of evidence that China is truly reopening. It is reopening to domestic travel. It is reopening to border transits between Hong Kong and China, particularly in the direction of Hong Kong to domestic China, as compared to the opposite direction. I'm not seeing a lot of evidence that they are encouraging travel abroad, except for CCP members and basically advocates of the Chinese system. Yeah. And likewise, I'm not seeing any evidence that they're encouraging Westerners to visit China. In fact, they have not reintroduced tourist visas they will allow Western investors to return to look at their factories, et cetera, right? So Tim Cook can go in and look at Apple, at, at the relationships that Apple has there. But we're not seeing any evidence that they're actually reopening. Yeah. Um, now, I could be proven wrong over time, right? This is the initial stages of it, et cetera, but I don't think so. And I think, you know, again, the model of the Soviet Union, you know, um, there's often discussion around the parallels between the Soviet Union and the hope that they, that China would go through something like Glasnost and Perestroika as they became wealthier, that they would reopen. Unfortunately, it's always been a historically inaccurate mode. And, you know, you never actually saw that happen. China or Russia opened up under Glasnost and Perestroika because things got so bad, not because things got so good. Yeah. Right. And likewise, having chosen, and I would argue this is what happened in 2013, having chosen not to move to a Western style democracy and relatively unfettered capitalism, 
The Chinese in 2013 made a decision to go in the opposite direction when they elevated Xi to party chairman and have now created a situation where they're moving in the opposite direction. I would argue, if anything, China has been closing for almost a decade now. And as Westerners, we just don't want to see it, right? Like we don't want to actually be honest with ourselves as to the process. The same thing played out with the Soviet Union in the 1930s, right? We, in every respect, the Bill Browders, et cetera, of the world, you know, who were Earl Browders, I'm sorry, who were, you know, the leaders of the U.S. Communist Party looked at Stalin's actions over the course of the great purges, et cetera, and said, well, this is all just, you know, part of the process of moving forward with the utopia, right? Um, I think a lot of Western business people and academics are very drawn to the, the Chinese model of, you know, a meritocratic um, authoritarian system where, you know, only those who have been properly educated and have properly participated in the system uh, are able to set direction. Yeah, right? I think that makes them uncomfortable in assessing that that, that system is actually failing in my, in, in my analysis. And a, a related question, which you've, you've also written about, um, is have we hit peak oil? Because obviously, if people have been saying, you know, with the reopening, demand's going to return to oil, in, if the industry is going to return, you know, oil is a, 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 a component of that, a, a key component. Um, and I know you've got a different viewpoint, so I thought you could take us through that. Well, I just, you know, so I want to be clear, you know, what I put forward in some recent writing is challenging a simplistic model that assumes demand just grows naturally, right? So um, people who are very good and, and truly oil experts are what are called barrel counters, right? So they can figure out supply far better than I ever will. Demand is one of these things that's very much a blind spot, right? It's, it's really hard to figure out what is going to happen to demand. And um, Pierre Onderon, who is a brilliant oil investor, has made an incredible amount of money, advanced a very simple view of, look, it's always been pretty straight line. There's a variety of issues with his analysis. And all I did was, was propose, well, wait a second, if we break down what you're seeing at the top here, it actually leads you in a slightly different direction. And I really do, unfortunately, think that that's the case, you know, um, while ESG is the current whipping boy for all the reasons why we haven't invested in the oil and gas space, I, I'll, I'll just tell you, I just don't think that's actually true, right? That's a narrative that people have adopted for reasons to fight back against it and everything else. But the simple reality is we had negative oil prices in the spring of 2020. We had incredible losses in the oil sector in 2015, 2016, again in 2018. Like it's been a very rough haul for an oil investor. And so to see the management teams that have emerged be, you know, structurally cautious is not the least bit surprising to me. I just don't think it has that much to do with ESG overall. Yeah. So uh, th that's my biggest concern. And, and the other component that I would just highlight is, is that, you know, unlike prior periods, we don't have the same rates of population growth. We've actually seen falling oil consumption per capita on a global basis for going on 30 years now. Um, and, you know, with slowing population growth, particularly in the high oil consuming regions, it's very hard to create models that say, like, we're fantastically, you know, underserving oil demand. If anything, it suggests that that there's very real risks that we could be quite close to peak oil. My math suggests it's somewhere in the 106 range, um, which is only about 6 million barrels above where we printed in 2022. And that in turn, um, you know, could take up to 2035 before we actually get to that point. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, now, I thought we could move on to your options and thematic ETFs at Simplify. Sure. You've got a, a range of very interesting ones and... Um, Particularly interesting, you know, as we discussed, the market environments might be changing, more volatility is ent entering the system and, and a number of your ETFs are popular because they give you some some uh, sort of protection against that. Um, so I thought you could start by going through your options based ETF range. So, you know, it's interesting because options themselves, I would argue, can be um, they can't I believe that they can positively contribute to portfolios they are inherently path dependent. And so 2022 was a really interesting year where despite the fact that the market fell 20% over the course of the year, 
at no point in the year did we experience like really significant moves, right? The number of kind of down 10, down 20% sort of moves that we saw in 2020 just didn't happen in 2022. And in fact, actually, most of the violent moves were to the top side. So it was kind of interesting to see that behavior. Again, that's consistent with some of my views on market structure, but was very frustrating from the standpoint of an options-based investor. Strategies that worked really well in 22 um, would be things like hedged equity programs, where you're selling a call option to fund um, a put spread. There, you're not overpaying for volatility. You're effectively funding the purchase of the downside protection with the sale of upside participation. Um, we have a product there that I'd highlight because it takes a slightly different approach, recognizing this path dependency component, competing products that are much larger in the hedged equity space will you know, do a series of quarterly options. So come September 30th, they will sell an out of the money call option for December 31st, and they will buy a put spread that's typically down five to 15% out of the money, right? Um, that is basically a vol neutral exposure because I've sold the top side to finance a downside put spread. That strategy also has an interesting problem, though, depending on where I am in the month or in my expiry cycle, I'm going to get very different response. So if I um, roll into new uh, put spreads, right, so that downside protection and the markets immediately fall that downside put option retains a lot more value. Therefore, I get less benefit from it. Within our product, HEQT, what we've done is we've moved to a series of three rolling um, three-month options. And so at every point in time, you're going to have options that are closer to maturity. You should get a much smoother response. It also reduces the rebalancing dynamic, the luck associated with that. Um, and finally, it actually gives you better strikes because you're continually resetting. So you're, you're, you constantly have stuff that is nearer the money or further out of the money in the form of the, the call spread or the call that you've sold. Um, I, I love products like that because we're taking an idea that's already out there and we're applying a little bit more rigor to the design of the product. And it's doing exactly what we would hope, delivering access performance. Um, within our um, convexity suite, we typically are taking a beta exposure to the S&P and then modifying that either with downside protection or with increased upside participation. That was, a, that was a very challenging product for all the reasons that I highlighted earlier in the year. We've made a lot of investments to improve that and we're excited for 2023. We're hoping that, that we can show much better performance there. Um, other option-based products that we have um, PFIX is a product that we use in the interest rate space, an area where people don't typically think about options. PFIX is what's is long what's called a payer swap option. So it's been a, a beneficiary of rising interest rates. The real benefit to a payer swap option is compared to say shorting bonds is that it has positive convexity in your favor, right? Meaning I can risk a relatively small sum of capital and make multiples of that if I encounter much higher interest rates, shorting bonds by definition has negative convexity, right? As the bond falls in price, the interest rates that I'm ultimately forced to pay rise as well as the quantity that I'm short actually falls, right? So my losses are magnified relative to my gains as we move forward. So that would be another example of a product that we use. And then um, two others that I guess I would highlight, uh, one would be SVOL, which is our short volatility. Um, uh, basically, it's a uh, what's called a capped variance position. We would treat it as comparable to, say, a covered call strategy. There, we're explicitly shorting the UX futures, um, the kind of inverse VIX stuff. And for those who uh, have followed my career at all, like one of the trades that I did that was well known was betting on the blow up of those products back in 2018. That turned out extraordinarily well. We've taken the insights from that experience and incorporated that into SFAL, where we're buying protection at the same time that we're selling the overall index, giving us a better risk managed profile than you would have if you were simply short volatility. And then the last product I would just highlight is, is um, uh, actually there's two more I would highlight. One is CTA, which is a managed futures product that doesn't explicitly have options in it. But 
the trend following dynamics behave very much like an option. Mm -hmm. um, that's an area that's super attractive if we're not sure about what's going to happen to prices. And again, as I'm highlighting, I'm suggesting that we have increased volatility more than certainty, right? Yeah. And so I am attracted to things like trend following strategies that'll let the market guide us in that direction. And then the last one I would just highlight is the one that I run directly, which is FIG. Um, that's our macro ETF. That's basically a way of putting together all the pieces of our puzzle, you know, um, under an asset allocation framework where it becomes just to set it and forget it. And that's actually been a fun product to, to manage in the public ETF space. And what are the benefits of generally of, the, of you know, going for an options ETF as opposed to something that does, doesn't include the option? Just for those you know, so the, the, the cleanest example is actually improved tax efficiency. So imagine a scenario where I'm long the S&P and protecting my portfolio through my own options. The S&P then falls in price. My put options go into the money. I make money on my puts. Those puts are then immediately subject to taxation under varying rules, but by and large, short-term taxes on your options. And hopefully you haven't had to sell any of your underlying S&P exposure, right? Now, what that does is it means it's incredibly tax efficient. I pay taxes on the gains, but I don't get any benefit from the losses. And there's a couple of ways that that can be used to manage it. But by doing that inside an ETF, I improve that significantly. I also candidly am just taking away a lot of the responsibility from that. One of the reasons why registered investment advisors, you know, your traditional financial planner, et cetera, don't do a lot with options is, is that it's a very small portion of the portfolio, right? So within our flagship um, uh, products in the convexity suite, like the option load should be kind of in the two to 3% of the portfolio range. We're spending a lot of time thinking about that two to 3% from an RIA standpoint or an asset, uh, an asset manager standpoint, that can be a real pain, you know, pain in the tuchus is, I guess, a technical term we can use there. Yeah. Um, so, so those are the key advantages. And just quickly, um, you also have a few thematic ETFs. I don't know how involved you are spe uh, specifically on those, but uh, I think there's one, the pink healthcare ETF was, is your, the one with the highest AUM. I don't know if you could touch on that quickly. Yeah, so so Pink is a phenomenal product. It's run by my good friend Mike Taylor, who was, um, you know, the uh, largest portfolio manager in the healthcare space for Millennium and Citadel at, at points before that, as well as running long only products for T Row, et cetera. Maybe an Oppenheimer. Now that I'm thinking about that, um, just the 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 easiest way to think about it is a super high quality portfolio management from somebody who's very skilled in the space. And all the proceeds, all the management fees for that product actually go to charity. We're hooked up with the Susan G. Komen Foundation. It's our way of doing what we think ESG should be, which is you know doing the best job you possibly can under capital allocation and then making the charitable choice of how you donate the proceeds associated with that. In our case, we're simply donating the management fees. And Mike has been extraordinarily generous in donating his time. Wow for exactly that purposes to, to make sure we can write as big of a check as we possibly can to the Susan G. Komen Foundation. That's awesome. Um, so I thought we could finish up with a quick fire round of a few questions. Sure. Uh, just on, you know, so something's related to investing, something's not. So what's your favorite book related to investing? Um, I mean, there's so many that are so good and there's so many that are so bad. <laughs> and I try to kind of pick from both, right? Um, when I'm picking bad, it's not because I think the writing style is terrible or anything else. It's just I think that the actual frameworks are impactful and wrong, right? So, like, I would encourage people to read A Random Walk Down Wall Street, um, understanding, you know, and really looking for the assumptions that underpin the dynamics of the efficient market hypothesis and the subsequent literature that emerged around it. Everything ranging from the presumed degree of elasticity of the market, again, that term that I used, you know, the efficient market hypothesis assumes all sorts of really interesting things, right? Every investor is the same size, right? Therefore, every investor has the same influence on the market. Well, that's clearly not true, Yeah. right? Likewise, it presumes that the impact of somebody buying and selling in the marketplace is very small and kind of intuitively that makes sense, right? You buy, I sell, 
Therefore, there's no net change to cash in the system. There can't have been that big of a deal. But if I run to you in distress and say, oh my gosh, Ed, I need to sell these shares to feed my family today. If you're any form of a thoughtful human being, you'll say, sure, I'll take 50% off and give you the cash, right? So the intensity with which I try to sell or buy is going to influence that. Um, the, the research that's out there today suggests that the efficient market hypothesis is misspecified the degree of elasticity in the market by 500 to one, right? Like that's just, it, it's just ridiculous that we actually continue to operate under systems that presume these things are true. So I would encourage people to go back and read some of that foundational literature and say, this is absolute garbage. Now, the flip side of that is what I would encourage people to focus on if they really want to think about what we need, what we should be doing in markets and how we should approach them, which is a book by Phil Fisher called Common Stocks on Common Profits. Right? And this goes back and this looks at the dynamics of really how to think about investing. It had a huge impact on Warren Buffett when he was introduced to it, to, to Phil Fisher's writings by Charlie Munger. Um, this is almost the quality style of investing and saying, find good companies, allocate capital to them, stay on top of them, but don't get too worried about it as long as you've done your initial analysis correctly. It's just a brilliant expose of what we should be doing in financial markets. And unfortunately, it's not what we're doing today. And what's your number one rule when approaching investing that you've learned over the years? If there is a number uh, one, I, mean, I know it's approach hard. Approach with your palms out and do it slowly, letting the market sniff you before you go to pet it. Okay. <laughs> um, where do you go when you wanted to chill out or wind down? Uh, for me, the easiest answer to that is always in a book. Um, yeah. But the, the answer you're probably looking for is to go hiking no, no, in good. the Marine Desert. Yeah. Okay. Um, who do you look up to in the world of investing? Is there some figure you follow or? Well, I mean, the, the, there's pros and there's cons associated with getting older, right? The, yeah. the getting older part is, is that there's fewer and fewer people um, that have more experience and are older than yeah. you at doing this. Um, with that said, you know, the single best stock picker and financial analyst that I've probably ever encountered is Chuck Royce, who I worked for at Royce and Associates. Um, you know, really do just think that he had an extraordinary mind, incredible steel trap mind for analyzing individual securities. Um, you know, people I've met that I got to be honest with you, like, you know, there's that classic, you know, if you sit at a poker table and you can't figure out who the asshole is, you're the asshole. Um, you, you know, the people that I've sat down with where I have felt distinctly uncomfortable at whether I was prepared to play the game with them are guys like Stan Druckenmiller, who is just you know, he's an incredibly kind and wonderful person who also um, has the uh, demeanor and general feel of sitting with, you know, the shark from Finding Nemo, right? That big grin that's just kind of like, oh, I'm going to eat you at some point. Um, so th those, those would be kind of two names that I would pull out. Thanks very much. Well, Michael, it's been great to, to chat. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to finish on to leave the community with. Where can they go? Uh, and follow you on Twitter, for example. So the easiest place to find me is on Twitter. I'm at ProfPlum99, P-R-O-F-P-L-U-M-99. That's a joke from way back in the days when I was uh, working towards my PhD. And just to be clear, I didn't finish my PhD because I found the academics ultimately too boring. But um, they can find me there. You can also sign up for Substack. I've started recently writing for Substack. Um, and excited by that project, the opportunity to move beyond 240 characters on Twitter is something I've been, you know, inching towards. Um, and then um, I also participated in an options focused newsletter called um, Tier One Alpha. You know, people can find either that on Twitter or find it um, uh, at www.tieronealpha.com. Um, so those are the areas that you can find my various contributions. Brilliant. Thanks, Michael. And I will include a link to the Simplify ETFs in, in the show notes for those who are interested. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Ed. Yeah. Have a good rest of the day. All right. You too. Cheers, Mike.